All right, moving away from the overview of the summer internship, we have the outline of our webinar for today. We have the production system, we have the skin, we have the overview of the nodal analysis, which is our system performance, and we have our DASIS law. DASIS law, we are just going to flip through it because I know most of us here have ideas about it. Okay, so our production system starts from the reservoir, where that is where our hydrocarbon is. The hydrocarbon flows from the reservoir to the well ball, from the well ball to the surface and into the separator. So it starts from the upstream level and it is moving gradually downstream. For this hydrocarbon to move from the reservoir into the wear ball, it has to overcome some resistive forces in which energy is lost at the end of the day. This energy, this loss in energy leads to changes in pressure. So as you're moving from the reservoir to the wear ball, there is a change in pressure that takes place and also from the wear ball to the surface. From the wear ball to the surface due to trying to overcome its own weight, try for the hydrocarbon is trying to overcome its own weight and also due to overcoming the friction between the flowing fluids and the walls of the tubing. For hydrocarbon to move from the reservoir into the borehole, it has to overcome certain forces that depends on the reservoir properties and also has to overcome forces that depend on its fluid property. The reservoir property in this case are porosity and permeability, and the fluid properties are, we have the uh, viscosity of the fluid and we have the formation volume factor. When the, when the hydrocarbon moves from the reservoir to the well bore, it has to now overcome other forces which we have already talked about. So our production system is made up of the reservoir the area around the wear ball, the casing and the tubing restrictions. Our restrictions here is the soft surface chokes and the soft surface safety valves. We have our well head chokes, we have the flow line and to the separator. So this is an overview of the various pressure losses that takes place within the reservoir. We have hydrocarbon at a particular reservoir pressure. It moves towards the wear ball at the sun phase, we have a different pressure of PWF, which we see there. And this PWF must be lower than the reservoir pressure. At the bottom of the wear ball, we have the bottom hole flowing pressure. And at the top of the wear ball, we have the well head pressure. And since the hydrocarbon is moving in this direction, then we, if we are considering the down hole system, then the well head pressure should be the lowest pressure along this line. Because if it moves from this direction, from the reservoir into the borehole, it simply tells us that the reservoir pressure is greater than the borehole pressure. Then therefore there must be a pressure gradient that gives us that allowance for that pressure for the hydrocarbon to move from the reservoir into the well ball because hydrocarbon always moves in the direction of lower pressure. There must be a pressure gradient before it can move. If there is no pressure gradient, then hydrocarbon cannot move. It means that if we create a static condition between the bottom hole and the reservoir, there is no way hydrocarbon will flow from the reservoir into the borehole. So we have a series of pressure losses that takes place as the hydrocarbon is flowing from the reservoir to the borehole and to the wellhead. Here we have delta P1, which is, the, which is the difference between the reservoir pressure and the pressure at the sun phase. And then we have delta P2, which is difference between the pressure at the sun phase and the bottom hole pressure. Delta T, P3, which is the difference between the bottom hole flowing pressure and the wellhead pressure. So we have different pressure losses that takes place within our production system. So if we look at the skin, because that's one aspect that we are going to be talking about a lot, 
So I just want to introduce you so that when we are talking about skin, someone should not be confused exactly what skin is. Skin is a dimensional term that is used to account for dimension, uh, additional well, uh, near well bore change in pressure. The skin can manifest itself as an increase, which is as a result of damaged well or a decrease due to stimulation. I already talked about the concept of stimulation when I was talking about the overview of our summer internship. And I gave a difference between stimulation and simulation because most students at the lower level always confuse between these two terms. Simulation is a process of determining the performance of the reservoir after a model must have been brought out. But stimulation is a means of production enhancement. That means you're either doing this by acid treatment or by hydraulic fracturing, which is a, which is a good thing for a production engineer. If you are having a decrease in skin or a negative skin, it's an advantage to you more than a, a disadvantage. But if you are having an increase in skin or a positive skin, it is actually an indication of a damage uh, well. So this is a picture of what I'm talking about. At the center, we have our world ball. Close to this, close to the world ball, we have our skin region that has been affected. Either it has been damaged or it has been stimulated. And this KS is the permeability of the skin and KF is the permeability of the formation. If this well has been stimulated either by hydraulic fracture or acid treatment, then it has actually increased the, uh, the permeability of this particular zone. It means that when the fluid gets into this zone, it flows faster. So if we have a situation where the permeability of the skin is greater than the formation permeability, now we're having a negative skin, it means that the well has been stimulated. But if we have a situation where we have particles that have blocked the pore spaces around this region. This region has actually been damaged because there is a, an additional pressure decrease when, it, when the fluid gets into this formation because there is higher resistance to flow. We have particles that have blocked the pore spaces, reduced the permeability, and the fluid finds it difficult to flow within that particular zone. So this is an, exactly the picture of what I'm talking about. We have the undamaged zone and we have the damaged zone. This is our pressure profile. You realize that if you trace the pressure profile, it's going to follow this particular path. But when the pressure profile gets into the damaged zone, there is an additional drop. This additional drop is as a result of damage. There is some kind of extra resistance to the flow of fluids that has been created as a result of the damage of that zone that is close to the well ball. Now, this is a better picture of what is happening. Forget about all of these formulas. They don't mean anything as to what we are explaining now. So if we have our pressure profile, if there is no skin, this is the path that is going to follow. But if there is a skin, it either goes up or it goes down, depending on if it is damaged or it is stimulated. If it is damaged, then there is an extra pressure drop that is created as the fluid gets into this particular zone. That extra pressure drop that causes that particular pressure profile to increase in slope, to increase, to increase in slope. But if actually the world has been stimulated, this simply tells us that the permeability around this particular zone has been increased. It means that this particular zone offers very resistance to the flow of fluid. The fluid gets to this zone, it flows faster. It flows faster. So there are various ways of classifying formation damage that depends on the process that produces that damage. We may have damage related to drilling, completion, and walkover operation because some of these operations involve fluids that may easily penetrate into the formation or they have to inject fluids into the formation and so on. So all of this process may mean injecting a fluid that is not compatible with hydrocarbon. If it's not compatible with hydrocarbon due to that incompatibility, they have to, some crystals are produced that these crystals now go ahead now to block the pore spaces, thereby reducing the ability of the fluid to flow into the well ball. 
We may have damage that is produced as a result of perforation or stimulation. I've already explained that term, stimulation or gravel packing. We have damage caused by the produced fluids themselves due to some kind of interaction that is taking place within the reservoir. So we look at the causes of formation damage. We have fine migration. We have talked about the concept of drawdown. When there is a drawdown at higher rate, as this hydrocarbon is moving from the reservoir into the borehole, it carries with it fine particles of sand, fine particles of silt, and at times we also have fine particles of clay that may be carried along with this hydrocarbon. When it gets closer to the well ball and the flow rate decreases, these particles are deposited closer to the well ball, deposited within the pore spaces of the formation closer to the well ball. As a result of that, that particular zone where that deposition has taken place becomes damaged and blocked, and thereby reducing the permeability. We have clay swelling. We have certain types of clay like sematite. It swells a lot when it absorbs water. It swells up to about, I think we may, if I'm not getting it wrong, close to about 600% of its size. It can actually grow very faster than its size. So when this clay absorbs water and grows, it blocks the pore spaces, thereby damaging certain areas within the formation. We have scales also, which are inorganic crystals that are deposited as a result of interaction between fluids within the formation. These deposits, when done around the well ball, can actually damage that zone and reduce its permeability. And we have, we could also have organic deposits like paraffins and alpha scenes, alpha tins around that particular well ball zone. So this is an overall picture of what that aspect of skin is. Because when we are mentioning it, it shouldn't be a strange term. Now, if we go back to our production system in order to carry out our system performance, the production system can actually be divided into discrete entity. We can actually subdivide them into different components. In this case, if we divide them into different component, component one, two, three, and four, you realize that each component adjacent to each other must have a point where they intersect, a point where they interact. That point of interaction between two components is what we call a node. That is what has given rise now to the term nodal analysis because you are analyzing the performance of that node, the performance of that point where the two systems are interacting because that performance actually gives us a picture of how the overall system is going to, to function. Now, if you are looking at, for, for example, reservoir one, we may want to look at how the flowing pressure varies with the rate. And if you plot the relationship between the flowing pressure and the rate, you're going to have a relationship that looks exactly like that. And if you go to component two and you plot the relationship of the flowing pressure with rate, you are going to have a curve that looks exactly like that. And the point of intersection between these two curves now gives us what what we call our operating point or, or, or system capacity. It gives us a system capacity. So the first curve that is due to the performance of component one is called the inflow to the node because we are actually analyzing the first node. So component one gives us the information about what gets into the node and component two is giving us information about what gets out of the node. So we have inflow to the node and we have outflow to the node. So for this function to actually function properly or naturally, the, the flow rate into the node needs to be the same as the flow rate out of the node. That's the reason why we have this point of intersection. If that flow rate into the node is not the same as the flow rate out of the node, the well cannot function. The well cannot function. Even if you are bringing in an artificial leaf method, that artificial leaf method is coming in to re-energize the system and make sure that there is a point where the inflow into the node 
is the same as the outflow from the node. Now, if we go back to our reservoir system or our production, our production system, we may subdivide the production system into reservoir, well ball, flow line, and the fuel stations and all of that. We are going to lay our emphasis more on the downhole nodes. We are going to lay our emph emphasis more on the downhole nodes because that is where production and reservoir engineers put more of their interest on. Surface facility engineers will be more concentrated on choke performance relation and all of that to analyze the surface nodes. So in this particular case, the performance of the reservoir, the relationship of the performance of the reservoir is called the IPR or the inflow performance relation. And the relation of the well ball, that is a flowing pressure against flow rate with the well ball gives us a curve which we call the tubing performance relation or the vertical lift performance. Now, this is actually what the downhole system looks like. We, we said there's an interaction between, there's a point of interaction between the inflow and the outflow. In this case, our bottom hole, in this case, our bottom hole is that point of intersection between the inflow performance and the outflow performance. And the pressure at that particular bottom hole, which is our node, is the bottom hole flowing pressure. Now, if we look at what we have on the screen, we said our node in this case is the bottom hole. It means that the pressure at that particular node is what we call the bottom hole flowing pressure. We want to analyze this system first by considering, by considering the upstream component of that system, then we have to consider the, out, the, the downstream component of that system. So we want to look at how this bottom hole is going to vary with respect to the reservoir and how this bottom node is going to vary with respect to the, the borehole. Remember that as the fluid is moving from the reservoir to the ball hole, there is a drop in pressure. That drop in pressure is what we call delta P reservoir. It's what we call delta P reservoir. That means if the reservoir pressure is, let's say, 3,000 PSI, and the well ball pressure is 2,500 PSI, it means that there is a pressure drop. There is a pressure drop of 500 PSI that must have, trans that must have transpired in transit as the fluid is moving from the reservoir to the well ball. So this simply tells us that the reservoir pressure is actually greater than the bottom hole pressure. Otherwise, if there will be no flow in that direction because there is a flow in that direction because there is a pressure gradient that is created in that direction. So in this case, our reservoir pressure is greater than our bottom hole flowing pressure. And the change in pressure now is the difference between the reservoir pressure and the bottom hole flowing pressure. So if we look at it closely, closely, we are going to have this relationship. Considering the inflow component, that means the reservoir component, to obtain the bottom hole flowing pressure, it is the same as the reservoir pressure minus the change in pressure that occurs in transit. I gave an example that if we have the reservoir pressure is 3,000 PSI and the bottom hole pressure is 2,500 PSI. It means that there is a drop in pressure of 500 PSI. It means that for me to get the bottom hole flowing pressure, if I take the 3,000 minus this change in pressure, which is 500, it actually gives me 2,500, which is the bottom hole flowing pressure. So to get the bottom hole flowing pressure, I take the reservoir pressure minus the change in pressure, minus the change in pressure that occurs in transit as the fluid flows into the bottom hole. Now, if I'm looking at the downstream component, which is our ball, well ball, I will realize that the fluid is flowing from the bottom hole to the well head. It means that the pressure at the bottom hole must be greater than the pressure at the well head, otherwise fluid will not flow in that direction. If I maintain the example of 2,500 PSI, 
if I have a well head pressure of let's say 500 psi, it means that there is a change in pressure within this particular component of 2000 psi. There's a change of 2000 psi. It means that to actually get our bottom hole flowing pressure, considering this downstream component, I can take this change in pressure, which is 2000 psi plus the 500 pressure, the psi pressure at the well head. We should now add up now to give us the pressure at the bottom, which is our bottom hole flowing pressure. So considering the outflow component, our bottom hole flowing pressure is equal to the pressure at the well head plus the change in pressure in the tubing, because we are interested in what transpires in the tubing, because that is where hydrocarbon actually moves to the surface. So we have the change in pressure varies with flow rate, which is obvious, that's what I've been talking about. And then we have the plot of the bottom hole flowing pressure and the flow rate gives the system flow capacity, which is what our nodal analysis is all about. So you actually plot the inflow performance relation that gives us the relationship between flowing uh, pressure and the flow rate of the inflow component which in this case is our reservoir. And then you plot the one of the outflow component, which in this case is our well ball. The point where they intersect gives us the operating condition. So we expect an intersection to take place. So this is what the production engineer has to actually do at the beginning, at the early life of production. Because you have to analyze the system to know if that system can flow naturally. How long will it take for this system to flow naturally? And when do I need to re-energize the system? Re-energizing the system simply means you need to start thinking of which artificial lift methods you're, you're going to use. Are you going to use maybe a gas lift or an electrical submissible pump or a soccer rod pump, depending on whether you are onshore or offshore? So you have to do all of this analysis and put all of those in place. And definitely, all of these things become part of what we call a field development plan. So if we are looking closely at the inflow performance relation, which we have already mentioned that it is the flow of the fluid from the reservoir into the borehole, then most of it will be governed by Darcy's law. It will be governed by Darcy's law. And if you look at it closely, the flow from, of that fluid from the reservoir to the well ball would depend on what? It would depend on the, the permeability of that formation. It depends on the thickness of that formation. It depends on the viscosity of the fluid. It depends on the formation volume factor. It depends on the radius of the reservoir and so many aspects. If you develop that relationship and you plot that curve, you are going to have a curve that starts first with a straight line and curves somewhere along the line. We are going to explain this concept. I'm just giving a general overview because our session next Saturday is going to be more on developing the IPR. What relationship do we use to draw the IPR? How do we actually bring out the IPR? That's what our next session will be. And then the last section now is going to be on how we can develop our vertical lead performance. So if I pick, if I pick two points on this curve and I calculate the slope, the slope is going to give me the change in pressure all over the change in flow rate. And our productivity index is one all over the slope, which gives us an SI unit of barum per day per PSI, which is our productivity index. So you realize from here that productivity index is inversely proportional to the slope. It means that if the productivity index increases, what happens is that the slope does what? Decreases. And the slope of this particular curve decreases by moving upward. And if our productivity index decreases, the slope does what? Increases. And the slope increases by this curve doing what? Moving downward. Of course, we have already mentioned that this inflow performance is affected by reservoir properties, which are, we have already mentioned so many of them. So there are so many factors that will affect the shape of this inflow performance relation. We have the reservoir pressure, we have the permeability, we have viscosity, we have completion, we have skin, we have 
our bubble point pressure, our bubble point pressure will actually determines exactly where this point is, exactly where it's going to curve. And then we have the drainage area. Now, if we look like, for example, if we say permeability, if we take for permeability, you realize from this particular relationship that the productivity index is directly proportional to the permeability. If it's directly proportional to the permeability, it means that if permeability increases, productivity index also increases. If we go back to this relationship that we have, if productivity index increases, it means that the slope of this graph decreases and it decreases by how? By moving upward. So if the product, if permeability increases, productivity index increases. If productivity index increases, the slope does what decreases and that decrease is obtained by moving, by the movement of the IPR upward. We might also have the skin. What will happen if there's an increase in skin? There's generally a, a skin component in this equation, which is not indicated, it usually appears down here. So you realize that the skin is inversely proportional to the productivity index. This means that if I have a high skin, that means skin has increased. If skin has increased, it means that productivity index will do what will decrease. The productivity index will decrease. And if the productivity index decreases, since it is proportional to the slope, it means that the slope is going to increase and the slope increases by moving downward. So you can have so many other properties and you start judging how these properties will affect the shape of the IPR based on the relationship of productivity index, which we are going to see ahead. That's what we are going to do next week. We could also have the reservoir pressure. Okay, we can recall that if this system is in static equilibrium, if the system is in static equilibrium, it means that there is no flow of fluids from the reservoir to the well ball. It means that our well ball pressure, our well ball pressure is exactly the same as our reservoir pressure. Then there is no flow rate. If our well ball pressure is exactly the same as our reservoir pressure, it means that this particular point where flow rate is zero gives us at the point of our reservoir pressure. That is the starting point. It means that the system starts from the reservoir pressure and the pressure starts decreasing as time goes as time goes on. It means that if there is an increase in the reservoir pressure, the IPR will no longer start at this point, but it's going to shift a little bit up. So we may have a relationship like that for higher reservoir pressure. So if we move away from that, if we move away from that and we go now to our outflow performance, which is the flow from the bottom hole to the well head. Now we are going to see what transpires within the tubing. The fluid first of all has to overcome three types of resistive forces, but we are going to mention, we are going to lay our emphasis here on two because one most at times is negligible. I'm going to bring out the formula and I'm going to explain why it is negligible. So if the fluid has to move from the bottom hole to the well head, then it has to overcome the weight of the fluid, which in this case is our hydrostatic pressure, and it has to overcome the frictional force between the fluids and the walls of the tubing. So our outflow performance, which we have already seen, is the pressure at the well head plus a change in pressure. So this, in this case, this is the better formula to see it clearly. Our bottom hole flowing pressure is the same as the pressure at the well head plus the change in pressure that takes place within the tubing. This change in pressure now can be subdivided into two components. We have the friction component and we have the hydrostatic component. We said there are three components, but we are neglecting one. I'm going to explain later on why we have to neglect that one. Definitely, our hydrostatic pressure is the same as what? Raw GH. That means this hydrostatic component depends largely on what? Depends largely on, on density depend largely on density. It depends also on the height. That is a depth. It depends also on the depth of the well. So if we move ahead. This is our, the change in, in friction. 
This is a change in pressure as a result of friction. So to calculate the frictional force, we have to use this particular component. Now, if you look at this component, this is a kinetic energy head. That means the change in pressure as a result of kinetic energy, which we have neglected in this particular formula. If you look at what we have here, it is not actually velocity. It is actually change in velocity. That means there must be a change in velocity along the tubing before we can consider this particular component. And the change in velocity usually comes as a result of varying thickness of the inner diameter of the tubing. Because if the inner diameter of the tubing increases, there's actually a drop in velocity. That drop in velocity brings an additional drop in pressure as a result of that. But since in most cases, we may have a uniform tubing inner diameter from bottom to top, we are going to consider that this particular component is negligible. So how do we develop the IPR? The IPR, how do we develop the VLT? Sorry, the inflow VLP, the inflow perform, the, the tubing performance relation or the vertical lift performance. We have, we say it depends on so many things. We have our bottom, we have our well head pressure, which we may consider it to be constant in this case. We may consider our well head pressure to be constant in this case. It means that the behavior of the bottom hole flame pressure depends largely on the change in pressure due to friction and on the hydrostatic head. So at the beginning, when there is no flow, at the beginning when there is no flow, what we are going to have is mostly the pressure head, the, the well head pressure and the hydrostatic component because the friction component is zero. There is no velocity. Friction depends on the velocity of the fluid. So if there is no velocity, it means that this particular component is zero. It means that at the beginning when there is no flow rate, our pressure is going to depend largely on the well head pressure and the hydrostatic component. So that's what we have. And subsequently, if we pick out points and plot the graph, we are going to have a shape like that. I don't want to go into how we are going to plot this graph and what are the various components that we bring in, but because we are going to do it during our third session, that is precisely what we'll be doing in our third week. So next week, we are going to take the IPR and we treat it well. And then the week after that, we are going to take the TPR and we do a brief introduction about the TPR. So that when we are talking about it, when we meet the Prosper software, we don't need to go and start explaining all of this concept over and over. So if you look at, if you look at the, the, the vertical lift performance, you realize that initially there is a drop. The drop may, be, may not be as high as what I have here, but generally you have a drop before you now have that increase. Why do we have this drop here? Because we expect that everything should be increasing. Why would there be a drop? Because at low flow rate, the velocity is very low. And if the velocity is very low, there is no enough energy for that system to lift the fluid up. So at the early part of that flow, what will be flowing mostly in the tubing is gas because gas is very light and it can easily flow at low energy. So until when the, end, the, the velocity gets to a certain point that the fluid start moving. But initially we are going to have more gas then. And if the system is made up of more of gas, you realize that when it comes to this hydrostatic component, it means that the, veloc the density of fluid inside the tubing is going to be very low at the early stage. That is what gives us this sharp drop before you start, before this, the, the performance starts increasing. All right, so there are so many factors that will affect the vertical lift performance. We have the well head pressure, we have the inner diameter, the roughness, we have the gas oil ratio, water curd, the, the density of the oil, we have the depth of the oil, and which artificial lift method we are using. We are going to see some concepts ahead to see how this variation can actually take place. So what if I have higher gas oil ratio? If the gas oil ratio increases, it means that inside the tubing, we have higher gas content. And if this higher gas content, 
is just similar to what I have just explained. It means that the density of fluids inside that particular column is going to drop. And in that density drop, the vertical lift performance curve responds to it by shifting downward to show that there is a drop in that performance. There's a particular drop in it. If we have higher water curd, if we have higher water curd, you realize that water has the highest density. Higher water is denser than oil and denser than, than gas. So if we have an increase in water content in our borehole, we are going to realize that there, there should be an increase in density. And if there's an increase in density, it means that this particular component will increase. And if this particular component increases, this particular curve is going to respond to that by shifting upward. So there are so many other factors which you are going to see ahead. We also have higher value when it comes to heavier fluids, deeper well. Deeper well means that we are going to have higher value of H and it thereby increases this component. And we have higher well head pressure. If the well head pressure increases, it means that overall all of this component also must have increased. So all of that responses by doing what? By shifting upward. So after drawing the inflow performance relation, we said the inflow performance relation is due to the performance of the reservoir. We are looking at the pressure at the node, which is our bottom hole in this case, with respect to the reservoir. And if you look at that with respect to the reservoir, you're going to produce this particular curve, which is our inflow performance curve. And if you look at the performance of that bottom hole flowing pressure with respect to the downstream component or with respect to the borehole, you are going to have this relationship. And if you plot this, you are going to have this curve which gives us the vertical lift performance or the tubing performance relation. And the point of intersection now gives us our operating system. So we can actually tell that that particular system is operating at a pressure of P0 and at a flow rate of Q0. Now, we are going to look at some certain questions and I may give people some time to see if you can reflect on the questions. Now, if you look at it, what is going to happen to the flow rate when the water cut reduces? A lower water cut, what is going to happen to the flow rate? What is going to happen is that if we have a lower value of water cut, we are going to come back. So the first thing you are going to do is ask yourself if that particular factor is affecting the inflow relation or the outflow relation. In this particular case, our water cut is affecting the outflow performance not the reservoir, it is affecting the borehole. It's affecting whatever happens in the borehole. So if we have, if we have, if we have a lower water cut, if we have a lower water cut, what is going to happen is that definitely water is denser than oil. So if more water gets into the borehole, there should be an increase. There should be an increase in density. There should be an increase in density. But if we are looking at this case, which is lower, it means that the water content has dropped. And if the water content drops, it means that there is a decrease in density in that borehole. Since we are now removing the heavier component, if you remove the heavier component, overall, this component is going to drop. And if this component drops, this particular entire curve is going to respond by shifting downward. So we are going to have this particular case, that's what we are going to have. This particular vertical lift performance curve will shift downward. And if you look at where it intersects, you realize that there is an increase in flow rate. So when you have lower water curve, the flow rate does what? Increases. Now, what is going to happen if we have higher PI, higher productivity index? What is going to happen? In this particular case, productivity index affects the reservoir. It doesn't affect the well ball. It affects the reservoir. So if I have higher productivity index, it simply tells us that the slope of that particular graph is going to drop. 
because we have already mentioned that productivity index is inversely proportional to the slope of this IPR, the slope of this IPR, since it is affecting body reservoir. The slope of this IPR is going to change. And since productivity index is inversely proportional to the slope, if the productivity index increases, it means that the slope is going to reduce. And the slope of this IPR reduces by shifting upward. And if it shifts upward, you realize that overall, the system is now performing better because we have higher flow rate. Now, what is going to happen if the gas oil ratio increases? If the gas oil ratio increases, the density of fluid inside the column reduces. And if the density of fluid inside the column reduces, this overall component is going to drop and it responses and it, and it responds by the VLT, the VLP moving downward, the vertical lift performance moving downward. And in that case, we have higher flow rate. Now, if we move now to the tubing size, what happens when the inner diameter of the tubing reduces? If you reduce the inner diameter of the tubing, what is going to happen is that the velocity of the entire flow is going to increase. And if the velocity of the entire flow increases, then there is an increase in this component, in the friction component, because this particular component is directly proportional to the velocity of the flowing fluid. So if the velocity of the flowing fluid increases, the friction component also does what? The friction component also increases. And if the friction component increases, the VLP responds by moving upward, then we have a drop in flow rate. So the flow rate actually drops. So it is a disadvantage for you to reduce the tubing size. So we actually want to increase the tubing size because when you increase the tubing size, the system performs better. The system performs better. Now what happens when you have deeper well? If the well is deeper, it means that our age increases. And if our age increases, it means that this overall component increases. The overall uh, bottom hole flowing pressure increases. And if it increases, we now have a lower flow rate. The flow rate drops. So you are supposed to know all of these aspects to know if it's a disadvantage for you to do one aspect or the other to see how you can ameliorate the system for it to perform better. So what is going to happen with higher reservoir pressure? The reservoir pressure is affecting our IPR, our inflow performance re relation. Remember, we mentioned earlier that this starting point here is the starting point of the reservoir pressure. So if the reservoir pressure is higher, it means that the system will no longer operate at this point, but it will start from a higher reservoir pressure. And if that happens, you realize that the IPR shifts upward and the point of intersection with the VLP, the vertical lift performance now, gives us a higher flow rate. If we have now a higher well head pressure, what happens with the higher well head pressure? We recall that this starting point here is the relationship of the well head pressure and the hydrostatic head. So if the well head pressure increases, it simply tells us that our vertical lift performance will also shift upward. And if it shifts upward, the point of intersection with the IPR now tells us that the system is going to be operating at a lower rate. Now, if we are increasing the diameter of the system and the system performs better, why don't we just increase the, the, the size? Why don't we just start increasing the size? Maybe you're, you're using a two and a half inch inner diameter tube. Why don't you just increase it to, let's say, six inch or even 10 inch or even 15 inch? Because if you increase it, it performs better. But if you do that, you, the system will not function. There comes a point where if you increase the diameter of that, the inner diameter of that tube beyond that point, the flow rate doesn't, do, does not increase. It starts dropping. So we are going to have a, a situation like this. So when you're increasing the diameter, the flow rate is increasing. But it reaches a particular diameter where we have maximum flow rate. And above that particular diameter, the, function, the, the system is now functioning, but backward. You realize that the flow rate is now instead dropping, 
but increasing. So there is a particular diameter that a particular system can function. And you have now to use this nodal analysis to determine the size of the tubing that is sufficient for production optimization. So application, what are the various application of uh, nodal analysis? We have what I've already mentioned, selecting the tubing, the flowing, si the flowing line size, the uh, sizing surface chokes, sizing subsurface safety valves, artificial leaves. We have completion, gravel parts, and all of this. So it has so many applications that you can use this uh, nodal analysis to determine. So if we have to flip through flow in porous medium, which is the principle that governs the flow of fluid inside the reservoir that was determined by Darcy, we are going to first of all start by determining the major primary reservoir characteristics. It depends on what? The first aspect we are going to look at here is a type of fluid. First of all, you have to look at what type of fluid is found within the reservoir. Because the flow rate, the permeability of the reservoir also depends on the type of fluid that is found within that reservoir. Gas is going to flow faster than, than oil. Why does it flow faster than oil? So the type of fluid in that reservoir is an important aspect that we have to consider in our Darcy's law, in our Darcy's relationship. So gas usually flow faster than oil within a reservoir be because there is this uh, phenomenon that happens when gas is flowing. At a particular boundary, what happens is that gas slides at the particular boundary where we have the green boundary, where we have green boundary. Gas easily slides at the green boundary. When it slides at the green boundary, it gives it, it gives it an extra push, and this extra push now increases the permeability of the reservoir. It is synonymous to, let's say, you want to go down a sleepy road on a rainy day, and you lose your stability. Once you lose your stability, you are going down slope at higher momentum. So that's what is happening in a gas reservoir. As the gas slides at the green boundary, it gives it an extra momentum that propels it faster than in than an oil reservoir. So the type of fluid could be an incompressible fluid or slightly incompressible fluid like our oil and our, our water and then our compressible fluid, which is our gas. We are now looking at purely the types of fluid that we have within the reservoir. So our flow regime, we are going to look at three types of flow regime. We have the steady state flow regime where the pressure within the reservoir does not change with time. It is constant all over time. And then we have the semi-steady state, which is also called the pseudo steady state, where the pressure is not constant over time, but the change is constant. The pressure is not constant. It changes with time, but that change is constant. So what we are saying here is, if after five minutes there's a change in pressure of five PSI, it means that in the next five minutes also, we expect to have that same change of five PSI. But for an unsteady state, the pressure is not constant and the change also is not constant. That means if after five minutes we have five PSI pressure change, in the next five minutes, it will not be five PSI. It could be six, it could be seven PSI. That means that particular change is not constant. So it changes as the time also is changing. So another aspect that we are going to consider is our reservoir geometry. That's one aspect that we are going to consider also, our reservoir geometry. And the first part of it is our radial flow. Radial flow is when the fluid flows into the ball hole from different, from all the directions. It flows from all directions. There is no hindrance in any particular direction that is stopping the fluid from flowing. It flows in all directions. And beyond that, we have the linear flow, which means that the fluid is flowing in one particular direction. It doesn't flow in other direction because if you look at what we have keenly here, we have fractures where the fluid, they, they would have provide path for the fluid to flow. So the fluid flows within those fractures in a particular direction and it doesn't flow in the other direction. We may have also spherical flow. This spherical flow occurs in a situation where we have perforation. We remember that if this is our reservoir thickness, if this is our uh, entire reservoir thickness, 
and they have to perforate this reservoir to allow fluid to flow from the res we have to perforate this well to allow fluid to flow from the reservoir into the well ball we they are not going to perforate the entire interval of that reservoir they are going to perforate probably this zone where we probably have our oil because the the fluid in this reservoir is segregated we have our water at the bottom we have oil in the middle and we have gas so since they are interested in oil, the perforation will be done mostly at the center of it. So you realize that within the reservoir, the fluid is flowing more or less in a linear manner. But when it gets close to the perforation, all the streams, all the streams now converge because every, every particle is struggling to get through that particular perforation to release itself. Because, you know, they are struggling to move from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. And since the bottom hole pressure is lower, they are now struggling to converge and move out of that particular perforation. As a result of that, we have a type of flow around this area which we call spherical flow. In pressure transit analysis, you mostly hear the term limited entry. You mostly hear the term limited entry. For hemispherical flow, we have what we call when the well is partially partially penetrated if you have a well that does not fully penetrate the reservoir you realize that at this particular point there will be flow around this particular area there will be flow around this particular area but up here there is no flow there is no flow around that particular area so this is just nominous to let you see the shape of the earth and then you can stop dividing at the equator you have the northern hemisphere and you have the southern hemisphere. So hemisphere is just like a semi-fair, a semi-fair. So if you look at it, if you look at the shape, this shape like this is going to give us that hemispherical flow, which is as a result of what? Partial penetration. So if you just glance at the Darcy, at the Darcy's law for, for our linear flow, you realize that it's going to give us the simplest equation of Darcy's law, the simplest equation of Darcy's law. This experiment was carried by Darcy using a cylindrical tube. What he did was he replaced materials that were in that cylindrical tube and tried to find out how the fluid is going to flow. What is the pressure dropped? These various materials that he replaced represent different values of permeability because the materials were having different permeabilities and they have and he now has to replace this material to now see what is going to happen as the permeability of the material changes. So this is the linear flow in a compressible of uh, compressible fluids like gas. This is the equation of the linear flow. And then for radial flow in an oil world, you are going to have this relationship. I'm not talking more much about this because I know you must have done a lot about this in class. So I'm just trying to just recall this because we are going to use all of these equations to develop our inflow performance relation. And then this is the flow for a gas well. This is the equation that governs the flow for a gas well. Radial flow in a gas well. And then this other case is the radial flow in an oil well. So thank you for this. We are going to take some questions. If you have questions, we will take some the next two or three minutes to answer some questions.